Ian Hunter, the former frontman of Mott the Hoople, is perhaps and arguably the greatest lyricist in the history of rock and roll. He's also one of the greatest songwriters. We took Mott the Hoople's template of crossing Bob Dylan with the Rolling Stones and made it his own. Last year, I caught up with them with a reform Mott the Hoople played at Manchester University in April 2019. So you missed the Ted period. Yeah. You're, about, you're in love with it though, aren't you? I just think being English is about dressing up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Motley Hooper were a good dressed up band, weren't they? Well, that was Pete Watts, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pete loved, loved it, unashamedly loved it, you know. The innovator, wasn't he? Yeah. And then, anything Pete did, the dolls, you know, Arthur was a huge Pete. Mm. He loved Pete. He copied him. Completely copied him. Pete, you're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> He was massive, you know, <laughs> little tiny voice. <laughs> and Gary Glitter too, six weeks after Pete did the Gladiator thing, you know, there's Gary on top of the pops. Gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> and Slade as well, I think. They... Yeah, Noddy, yeah. Did they come down and see Mott the Hoople in 69? They came to um, Guildford Civic. No, no, well, Wolverhampton. Yeah, because I saw him at a gig in Germany and we wound up in the pub and he said, yeah, he said, we all come down. And that was the night we decided to form a band. Because we thought if you could do it, anybody could. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a backhanded compliment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one of my regrets of being 58. I wish I'd seen Mott the Hoople in that early period. Yeah. Because people like Mick Jones always tell me mm -hmm. what a great band that was. It was desperation, it was uh, a shambles. Uh, and that's good stuff, you know. We never thought that at the time, but it, it actually was good stuff, you know. It was either that or the factory. Stan used to say, you know, Wiggins is Monday morning on the way to the gig to just rev them up. Yeah. Yeah, because people weren't queuing up Ireland. We got on Ireland, but uh, there was no other people wanted us, you know. So Ireland had us more or less by the balls, you know, contract-wise and everything. But they, they looked after you, didn't they? They gave you four albums. Yeah, yeah. Which didn't really... No. We were big records, weren't we? We, we wouldn't have lasted there. Uh, no, no, we wouldn't have lasted no, five minutes. Yeah, but they were selling out like crazy. Mm. Yeah, gigs were selling. That, that happened a lot in them days. You know, Adam Faith would be making singles, but such was, you know, filling places every night of the week. Uh, you know, uh, Tommy Bruce was filling places, you know. Uh, Jimmy Page is near on the Gladiators. Um, a lot of them bands, they were filling out, whereas the pop in them days wasn't filling out gigs, you know. So it's, it's what you either sold records and no yeah. tickets, you yeah. sold tickets and no records. Yeah, that was us, but well, we knew eventually something's got to happen. <laughs> because uh, at that, we were doing two, three thousand seaters and we were filling on it. And you, you can't do that without a record for any length of time. It, it just, people just fall off. You'll keep, you'll keep your core, you'll keep your Mick Jones people, but you, you'll lose the casuals because you're not all over the press and in the charts and on the radio, you know. So it's just a matter of getting the right record, yeah. the right sound. Because mm -hmm. Guy Stevens, I mean, God bless him, but he was chaotic, wasn't he? He's, uh, oh, yeah. he was well, sort of managing you, wasn't he? Or uh, well, you were managing him in a sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were over in the States and it was like, this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, where is he? We were fishing him out of places and picking him up. And, I loved him, I mean, we all did, but uh, to call him a manager is like ridiculous, you know. <coughs> and we were jealous of people like Roxy who had this steady situation going on behind them, you know, and organisation behind them, you know. Our, our, we, ours was just a mess. And very frustrated, you know. I mean, is it, what is it about you? You seem to attract these kind of maverick characters. I do love characters. I yeah. Do, yeah, I do love characters. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm more. I was in a Muso band for a little while once, and uh, you've heard of all of them. And I just remember being on the bus and listening to the previous night's gigs, which to me is like hell. <laughs> and just thinking, this is the last place I want to be on earth. I mean, if you're going to do it, you should enjoy it, you know. They seem to be enjoying it, but I wasn't at all. I'd much rather the chaos, you know. Mm. So is that what it'd be like, toy and mops, it would be chaos on the bus? Yeah, they're quite natural. They weren't putting it on. They were all. I think I was the sanest one of them all. I mean, what they were getting up to, and they were all totally different, you know. 
And so that kind of worked for a while as well. But my friend who's coming tonight, actually, his auntie went to school with uh, Pete Watts yeah. and Anne Buffett and said they were just completely mental characters at school. Yeah. They would be setting fire to desks, setting fire to the teacher. Like, uh, maybe Pete Watts would be but doing There'd be it. a logical reason for that. That was the weird thing with Pete. He could rationalise anything. <laughs> Quite intelligently, too. It's like, what the fuck am I? <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> But as, bad, as, as, as great as it was, it was, it was also, they're very Hereford. I called them the Hereford Mafia, you know. There were certain things they weren't going to do. I mean, to get them to London was a nightmare. Then the states cropped up. They weren't going there. I mean, they were still going back to Hereford on the weekends, you know what I mean? They're very much, I read that book, The Undertones, wrote, like, dedicated to failure type band, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was kind of like that, yeah. They didn't really want to, it was, when De Vries was managing us, it was a nightmare, you know. So I can't really blame managers per se because we're pretty much unmanageable, you know. Because the band, and one of the reasons people love the band was because it was unlike Dire Rock and Roll Star. It was like the small town band that somehow got into the big time, wasn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I wanted it, you know. Until we got I really wanted it. I mean, that, that's the whole idea, really, isn't it? Yeah. Whatever you do, you want, you want to get somewhere with it. But, uh, and every time we did, we just did New York, and for, um, it was great, and it was like, well, <laughs> this can't be my the earth one, because every time we did New York, we blew it, you know, like, <laughs> or, or even we didn't blow it, like the sound system would break down, or something like that would happen, you know. In bombshit Idaho, we'd be great, no <laughs> problem, but the minute we hit LA, or, you know, like, we, we always, uh, I was dreading the beacon, and the beacon was fabulous. <laughs> So, I mean, what, so what was it like the main man with that? Because obviously that's, he's got a reputation, had a reputation, very ambitious, driving manager. Yeah. The opposite, so was he just completely confounded by Mott the Hooper? Who was it Yeah. Well, they were, David was too. <laughs> they couldn't quite understand, like, what the Freeze couldn't understand was, um, he just told David, David would say yes or no to any specific thing during the course of the day. But with our lot, you know, it had to be 5 nil, as you've heard before, I'm sure. I've said it many times. Couldn't be 3 2, couldn't be 4 1, had to be 5 nil. And there's always one who was being an asshole at the time or insecure or whatever. And so we never got anything done. And David took me out the stage, Daddy says, You're going to have to do something here, you know, because it looked like I was the leader from the outside. And uh, I remember, I always remember, because we were in the City Squire, David was in some posh hotel, I forget which one it was. We went to Stage Delhi, and then I went back to the City Squire, got them all in my room, and I said, OK, this is what's going to happen. And David's saying I should run the band, because only one person got it. And before I even finished the sentence, Ralph went, like, fuck. <laughs> and that was the end of that, you know. <laughs> So the real problem what the Hoople is, it's five leaders. Five very strong personalities, yeah. Yeah, and also that's one of the great things about what the at the same time. Yeah, I love yeah. them, I, I, I love all of them, but that was a nightmare, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the amazing thing about what the Hoople has actually lasted as long as it actually did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was exhausted at the end of that lot. And he was like, well, what, why, why are you leaving? <laughs> because, because you're in a hospital you bed. not seen what's been happening around here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, so when, when you initially came back to Mott the Hoople, it's, it's the classic lineup, so called classic lineup. Yeah. But this lineup, you wanted to do this lineup as well, didn't you, to incorporate that into the show? Yeah. But it should be, I can understand it could be awkward to original members, can't it? But yeah. it would have been great, actually, as a theatrical piece, wouldn't it? Kind of the history of Mott in a way, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I, to me, I don't see the, the problem. I mean, every time you do it, there's a hiccup in sales, and you know, people will go up and say, we're putting that vinyl now, which they wouldn't do if I didn't do this. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a little hiccup for everybody, a little bump. But uh, they really didn't want to include Morgan and Luther. And I understood, I got it totally. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did, I'd been with Morgan and Luther, and Luther especially, you know, it saved the day at the time. And I thought they were owed, and particularly as they came to both those uh, get-togethers that we did, 2009, 2012, and they were great about it. They weren't bothered. You know, I remember Luther coming in at the O2 afterwards. I don't give a shit what anybody says. It's the best year of my life ever, you know. Yeah. And I just thought, if I get a window, we've got, we've got to do this, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. 
I mean, he is a, a great guitar player, and in a in kind of very yeah. very it's unconventional way. Darby, yeah. you know, it's an abstract way that he plays that people confuse people, you know, but. Uh, He's a great guitar player and, and everything is still still the same now. I mean, the energy level is alarming, you know, just, and, he, and he's a, such an upper to be in a band. And Morgan's, well, you'll hear it, you know, he plays gorgeous. I watched it all on YouTube. Yeah. Bands just sound fantastic. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because it's the ramp bands, it's Well, they've been doing the rock right material, yeah. like I say, you know, for a long time. So what am I going to do, go out and get, like, session guys? The only logical thing to do is what we did, you know. Yeah. Mm. So, so when you revisit them on the Hoople stuff, I mean, you play a lot anyway, don't you? You sell them shows. We'll do Memphis, do stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So to, to you, it just it's almost like doing just touring anyway. You're on your tour, but so it's a little move. guys yeah. popping in. It's a bit more energetic, actually. The nature of the set itself is, is a bit more energetic. It's a good set. I like the set, but it does take a little more out on you. I think it's because I do piano on my, in my own situation. Uh, and do about like a third piano, whereas we're in this, you know, Morgan's there, so there's no point. So I'm just uh, posing away in the middle with a fucking guitar that's not heard, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but when you do the piano, you know, at my age, you sit down for a third of the set, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm not allowed, you know, I have to do it all the way through. Well, Bob Dylan sits down for virtually the whole set now, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's still going, he's still got it. It's amazing. I mean, he's younger than you, though, isn't he? A couple of years younger than me. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, uh, and he knows that too. He told somebody. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I had a Swedish fan played the Globe in uh, uh, Stockholm. Yeah, and apparently he mentioned that to a fan of mine who had a T-shirt with my name on it. What person says I'm older? Than, uh, I'm younger than him. <laughs> so you so you want the yardstick? <laughs> the one was yes he, <laughs> he knows me <laughs> I'm still like a 12 year old when it comes to Bob yeah yeah oh, Bob's the yardstick for me yeah. you know for a lot of people but for many I mean many of us growing up Bob Dylan was great of course but because you were an English version mm. we could totally relate to what you were singing about and for us growing up at that time you we preferred your lyrics because they were about our world in a sense yeah, you know? yeah. but I didn't understand his lyrics I just knew he was right I mean, the first time I ever saw him, I don't know what the fuck that is, but it's amazing. You know, still to this day, I think he's one of the best comedians in the world, you know. He does have a wry sense of humour. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. book he wrote, it's like the Chronicles, it's like, come on. <laughs> yeah. It's great, you know, I don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, the big influence was, was the Stones as well, wasn't it? I mean, how do you write to them these days? You still... The Stones are like any great rock band, you know, like one out of ten. And I remember seeing the Stones, it would have been maybe mid 80s or something. But it, they had a big flower that went over Madison Square Garden for a week. And I went about the fourth night, and they weren't very good at all. And I, I saw Dylan outside uh, the other end later on that night. And he said, What do you think of the Stones? And I said, oh, well, I Bob Dylan asked me about the Rolling Stones. <laughs> So I, I said, well, they weren't all that great, you know, like, and he said, nah, apathy for the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so I went straight over to that apathy for the devil, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you see those bands, you know, they've got the stadium level, and Mott Wall is big, weren't they? But cult in a sense, you know, it was, it was nearly there. Is it frustrating? No, not at all. I mean, I... We would do places like the Philadelphia Spectrum. Admittedly, uh, Alice Smith would be opening, or, or you know, the Queens. But that's an 18,000 seat. Yeah. We, we were doing all right. Not, a lot of places, no, 2,000, 3,000. The odd 10,000. Milwaukee, I remember, was a 10,000 seat. Yeah. Long, uh, Long Beach, some areas. I mean, Cleveland, doing for a week, you know. Mm. But in the main, you know, LA was Santa Monica Civic, which was probably, what, 1800, 2000, something like that. So they were big in some places and smaller in others. Because you've always said you preferred being on a periphery, but I mean, yeah. that's obviously not the periphery as I would understand it. That's, that's a big periphery, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Do you think when a band gets into that stadium thing, it's, it kind of spoils it quite? I didn't like it at all. I mean, the bit that I saw, I mean, we saw it for, I, I always say a fortnight, but I don't know how long it was, but I didn't like it at all. Because a lot of things come into play, like what we just did. We did two to three thousand seaters in America just, just, and you see the scalping that's going on. 
you know, you just, people buying tickets for 40 bucks and so on in Cleveland for 500. They're making money out of money. There's no talent attached to that. It makes you sick. I'm a club guy, that don't happen. Uh, you know, you just pay you and you get in, and that's it, you know, simple. And the minute you start getting a little bit bigger, uh, all the shit starts flying, and that's what I don't like about it. You know? mm. I was in it for the original, I was in it for Little Witches, like Catherine Granada, Sam Cooke opening. Wow. I was yeah. in it for Bobby Ollie at Leicester de Montfort. That's what I was in it for, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16. That's having, having not existed until that point. And the then world, hearing that. The world went technical when Little mm. Richard turned up. Yeah. yeah. And he was a governor. I've never heard anybody sing like him before or since. Yeah. And, and, and in a way, what you do is you, you maintain that spirit at that moment to this day. That's it, yeah. yeah. A bit lacking in the talent department because they were all great. They were, I mean, Jerry Lee and all that. That's why I was, I never thought I'd be in the business. I just thought, I mean, they, them guys could sing and play, you know, they really could. But I, I was just a fan. You know, I was a fan of PJ Pro, I was a huge fan of Pro. Never thought I'd have actually, it was an accident along the way somehow. Yeah. Yeah. But boy, you, you do have a talent as a, as a songwriter, don't you? That's... I found that out later, yeah. 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 That, was, that was something I could do, you know. So initially at first, it was just the excitement of seeing these people on stage. You had to be on stage. Yes. But you didn't know how you were going to get onto the stage because yeah, you didn't yeah. play anything. Yeah. yeah, I remember going, I saw Lowell and Hardy at Shrewsbury. They go, the Granada, Shrewsbury, Granada. I just remember, I wanted to know what was going on backstage. I mean, it was great seeing them, but I, my whole thing was, it must be amazing backstage. It must be another world, you know. <laughs> and that's usually the sign of you want to be in the business at some point, yeah. And when you finally got to the bit where there was a backstage, yeah. then it started for well, a long time. Well, you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the same colored walls yeah, around yeah. the world, isn't it? Exactly palatial, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Needs a hoovering. <laughs> yeah. Bit like dying rock and roll stuff as well, when you hoover the flat before you fly to America. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like normal stuff. I've never, I've never liked the f- stupid stuff, you know. Yeah. No. I don't... I don't it's not, it's not what it's made out to be, you know what I mean? I know, I know a lot of people say that, and then a lot of people think, well, you're full of shit, but... I mean, yeah, it's nice if you can get around, if you can walk in the shop and buy something. That, that's great, and all the rest of it, but I've never felt like I needed a... a boat, or a jag, or a... something posh. I've never, I've never had that problem, and I'm lucky. Because a lot of people have that problem, you know. I never did. Is that because it took you 15 years of working in factories, well, being, not, being in the real world, being grounded? More than likely, because you know what it is. You know what the opposite is. And I remember thinking, uh, this is not right. This isn't going to work. The other end, I'm thinking the other end, even then, when I was 17. This ain't working, British Timkin, you know. Like, this isn't going to work. A, a premium bond a, a month or a week. It's not going to work. I mean, if you, if all you've got to look forward to is Littlewoods, I didn't take, I didn't trust that. I thought you've know, got somewhere down the line, you're going to have to do something to get out of this, you know. So was it purely music? That was that's the only way you could get out, or was, or was there other options you could? Well, in them days, for for kids like us, you know, it was uh, football, uh, football music, and I was crap at football, mm-hmm. and I'm glad it, I was crap at football because right now I'd be athletic, you know, <laughs> which I'm not. Yeah, so, yeah. So rock and roll is actually good for your health. Yeah. Yeah. Young man's game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. When, when did you realise you actually had some kind of musical talent? Did it take a few years or did it sort of manifest quite early? Could you imagine the songs in your head but you couldn't actually play them? Was it all, how did it all come together? Just, uh, I had a, a little bands around Northampton, like I said. Mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, I saw this bloke in a pub one night. I was going around like, looking for gigs in the surrounding area of Northampton and uh, I saw this bloke by a jukebox and it was Freddie Fingers Lee who had been with Such, the piano player and uh, Fred was, had, had had an accident, he'd come off a Liverpool... Uh... Empire? Yes, yeah. you know the sloping stage, the piano had come off on top and he'd been under it, he'd gone down and the last thing he remembered was Such <laughs> looking at him and ring the papers, that was the last <laughs> thing he remembered. Yeah. And such immediately got Paul Lick, Nicholas, the guy that later became one of those West Coast, uh, West End stars. You oh, know. Grandma's Paul, Paul Nicholas. 
Paul Nicholas. To replace yeah. him and left him in the hospital and he's sitting there on his own and he gets out and he goes back to steal the victim, which is how I met him in this pub. Mm-hmm. He's covered in dust and but he had a glass eye. And uh people been here. So I, I knew I knew it was Fred. And I walked up to him, I said, you know you're Freddy Fingers in. He said, I thought I was gonna hit him. <laughs> it's all like I said, no, 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 I'm a huge fan of yours, you know. So he, he joined the band I was in in Northampton. I'd been trying to sing and everything. He said, no, 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 you, you go over there and play the bass. So we sat the bass player and I got a bass and I just went up and down the bass note. Before I found out what the other three were, I just went up and down like that. And Fred could still go to Hamburg, like, you know, all these German places. And so you'd get a job for six weeks and then you would go with Fred and you'd be playing nine hours a night. So you, I, I figured out the rest of the string, so now I'm a bass player, you know. And he was like, encouraging me songwriting. He said, don't ever sing, but like, your songwriting's good, that's what you should concentrate on. And so from there I went to Francis Day and Hunter, they were paying me 15 quid a week uh, to write songs for Engelbert and Tom Jones. Me and uh, Roger Adam. Roger Glover. Roger Glover, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Doing that for 15 months, and then the call, I met, I met the Mots. Oh, for the famous audition where you did the 10 minute bass solo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you've been learning for three years? Well, I was desperate. Uh, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I wanted that gig so bad, you know. You, yeah. you just played, did you play one of the songs you've written in that? I Could played you? Laugh At Me. They always yeah, say yeah. I played well, like a while, so I did. I played Laugh At Me, Sonny Bonham. Yeah. yeah. And that's an interesting influence as well because he's not, you know, because ostensibly I guess they were almost a proto progressive rock band who wouldn't like some like the song of that, would they? And you come in, it's kind of a really weird raft of influences that you've got, haven't you? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I just thought he was great because to me, as a songwriter, CFMG, you write a song around CFMG that's, that's great, which he did on more than one occasion. That's some, you know, you can write a song around 15 different modulations and God knows what else. But, but to just those two chords or those three chords, and he did it consistently. And he is also Phil Spector's uh, engineer, so he, he knew a bit about the other side of it as well. No, he's a very talented bloke. Well, no, it's, it's a great song, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so I did that. Because I, I wasn't that great a singer, so he, he wasn't either, so that's what I was doing. I was copying Bob and copying Sonny Bono. But you totally found a space where your voice works. Mm. I mean, I guess that's not that a trick. It takes a while, yeah. Yeah. But that's what Guy liked. That's what kept me in the band. Because the first nine months, it was really... The, the band didn't want me at first, and Guy did. And then there was a period where um, it, things turned and Guy wanted me out, and then, then the band wanted me to stay. So the first nine months were really dodgy, you know? Mm. Yeah. Because you're on the outside, aren't you? Because they're already a unit, aren't they? Sorry? They're already in a unit, aren't they? So you're kind of parachuting in, aren't they? Well, at first, yeah, they were, it was really strange. I mean, I went, they, were, they had a flat in Lower Sloan Street, just off Sloan Square, and I went, and Stan was the only one that spoke to me. And this is me in the band, and I don't know anybody, and nobody's talking to me. Stan's the only one, yeah. And yeah. Stan, I'm replacing. I'm wondering when he's going <laughs> to poke me, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a strange dynamic. Yeah, yeah. I remember Buff pa- passing me on the stairs, and he's never looked at me. Yeah. Straight past, no. Yeah. So what did it take to win their confidence, or, or the other way around, to just oh, tight? They, they were always tight, you know. And Mick Rouse, perhaps a little less tight, because he, he had a, Mick was quieter and more West Country-ish than, than actual Hereford. But Pete, and Fally and uh, Buff, they were very tight. They were very tight, yeah. Because they went back. I always felt like uh, I was from somewhere else. Although I was only from Shrewsbury up the road, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I always felt a bit outside that band, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you start bringing songs in, is that when they start to realise that you were actually a bit kind of useful? <laughs> well, what happened was Pete and, Pete and Mick were the writers, mm. and, uh, and Pete, all he wanted to do was pull birds, you know, so <laughs> the minute we started happening, he, he just wasn't, oh, you do it, you know, you can do it, you, you're better than I am, you do it. And so they, uh, that's how I started, you know, for serious mm. writing, you know. And uh, we were in uh, Islington, the Angel, I think it was the Angel, it was a pub in Islington, and they had all this gear, and I'd never... You know, all I had was, uh, I don't know, a guitar or something, probably. I can't remember what I had. I didn't have a record player. I had one of them little singles jobs. 
what was that's it? That. Little green thing, yeah. 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 But so to see all this gear, so I started turning up like four or five hours before they did and playing on all the stuff. And that's how a lot of that stuff got written on that first record. Not that there was much written for the first record, but uh, I remember Half Moon Bay, yeah, because Fally's organ was there, you know, and I'd never really experienced that before. Mm. Sustain instead of just like, just playing a piano, you know, you could sustain, you know, it was always gear. So they'd turn up at three, you know, you'd play a bit of something, and, and they were great that way, they were totally unselfish that way. They were like, if they heard anything, straight away, what's that? You know, and so that's how it worked. Mick, Mick would come in with bits, I would come in with bits, Fally would come in with bits, and the others would go like, yeah, what is that? So it was great that way. So there you are, you have this reputation, this kind of probably the toughest live band in Britain or whatever it is, and then, then this really bizarre thing happens that David Bowie gives away probably the best song he's ever written. Yeah. And he just gives it to Mott the Hoople, which is really weird. And, and it's also, I would argue, it's probably one of the cover versions where someone actually turns it into their own song as well, you know. It's, when you actually hear his, his version, you think, wow, is that it's kind of odd to listen to, to it? Oh, I think that's why we got it, to be honest with you, because I think he was fed up it. with it. Yeah. You know, and we just happened to be there at the right time, you know. Yeah, because he, I, I'm the same as you. Uh, he sat down and played it, and I'm like, what are you giving that away for, you know? It's, but then he'd done it in C, which is a lower key. And apparently there's a lot of alto on it. I, I can't, I think Morgan's heard it, but I, I, I don't think I've ever heard it. And he was, he just went out of ideas. But having said that, when we, we went down Olympic Barnes and it was in two evenings, that and one of the boys. And uh, he knew exactly what he wanted us to do. I remember spending, he was spending time with Fally, with the organ and all that. And there was a lot of time spent on harmonies. He knew what he wanted. So why he hadn't done it himself, I don't know. Did he, do you think he felt like he needed a band like Mott Hoople? You know, it had to, it had to be a, a tough, pretty rocking type band. Something something weird in it. A weird little X factor that no one can ever put the finger on. I and mean, he saw that, didn't he? Do you think? I don't know what he saw. I, mean, I, I, I know he thought we were tough. I know that. Because mm -hmm. I, I used to talk to Ange, and Ange would tell you. Mm -hmm. Like the first time he came to see us, it took him four hours to get ready. He told me this, you know. Uh, whether that was an exaggeration, it probably was, as <laughs> Ange. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he, he just. Uh, we were doing a tour, a, a, a tour for uh, Ireland, and uh, all of a sudden these flowers start appearing in the dressing room everywhere we go, you know, and Johnny Glover and Alex Leslie, the Ireland guys, they were like, what the fuck's it? What's all these flowers doing here, you know? And this was us being courted by David, you know? <laughs> and he think, I think he thought I was a motorcycle bloke before. I, according to Andrew, that's what he thought, which wasn't true, you know, but I don't know. I'll go along with that, I don't care. You had a fascination with bands like that, didn't you? Like the Spiders and the same thing, a bunch of blokes from Hull that he brought down to London. Yeah. You know, uh, like a, I guess in the ways in his head, he thought these kind of tough provincial bands would give his music a bit more oomph. Would that be it? Maybe. I mean, Ronson pretty much converted him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he was a folk singer. I saw, him, I saw David in the 60s, maybe 66, mm. you know, with the Perm and the Revox, mm. you know, doing that. And I thought, I don't know what that is, you know, but like uh, after the show, there was a mile long of women out waiting to get in. And so we had this thing, you know, they, yeah, girls loved it. So I, I guess because there's not much time left, I want to know what, what you're doing apart from what the hoopla is. Well, you got, you've, you've written another album, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. back end of it, yeah. And yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens next, you know, it's nice. I mean, it's quite interesting because a lot of bands, I mean, yes, we talked about the Stones before, and they're a jukebox band, aren't they? It's a great jukebox, great hits. Yeah. But you keep going, it's got this compulsion to keep writing and keep moving forwards. Yeah. And is that something you've always had? Is that... You've got a motivation. Mm. Well, the only motivation that I can have is, is trying to be better than I was before. You know, that's, that's the only motivation I've always had. And also, I'm getting old and I'm not supposed to do it, so that's motivation. There's a lot of motivation if you go looking for it, you know. Well, you're trying to get it all in while you can now. Well, you know, that's what we're here for, isn't it? Mm. We're not supposed to just sit in the kitchen and go, oh my God, and look at the clock, you know? No, as long as I'm on two legs and happening, you know? I don't see the point. I mean, I can't imagine not doing, any, not doing anything. I can't imagine anybody not doing anything, you know, unless, unless they're fucked up. But most bands, when they get to 40, just 
just play for two hits and just go around playing these venues in circles, you know. I mean, yes, of course, that's what you, you'll be playing the six hits tonight, etc. But yeah, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a this is like a holiday from your normal pushing for us. <laughs> it's <isn't> a holiday. It? <laughs> <laughs> a holiday. It's harder work than usual. <laughs> Let's see with him over there, you know, <laughs> cramping me. <laughs> I've got to stop because yeah, no, cool. Everyone, no, I appreciate your time there. You're welcome.